Um, so I'm in Bitcoin since 2013. I'm interested mostly in the Rust Bitcoin ecosystem, Bitcoin Core and Lipsec P, tries to help as much as I can. Um, and we're going to talk about Taproot, which is a new proposal by Peter Willy to add some cool stuff to Bitcoin, which first of all, it's Schnorr. So what are Schnorr? Yeah. Okay, so we have ECDSA and Schnorr. ECDSA is what we currently use in Bitcoin. I played a bit with the equation, so they'll look pretty similar. Um, and we'll start as a quick overview of the glossary. We have a message, which is M. We have E, which is a hash of a message. Now, in practice, it's going to be a hash of more than just a message to mitigate some attacks, but I tried to minimize the amount of complexity so people can actually compensate everything here because otherwise it can be a very long tack. Um, yes, so D is the private key, K is some random nonce, G is the generator point, so um, Jimmy talked about this this morning, but I'll recap. Um, elliptic curves is just like you have a point in a graph, and scalar is a fancy math name for just a number. To convert a number to a point, you need to multiply it by some generator point. Okay, so by multi multiplying a scalar by a generating point, you get a point on the graph, which is just basic, basic x and y on the graph, nothing new. This is all high school algebra, like, except the EC part, but never mind. <laughs> um, yeah, and one thing to note is that this is a one-way function, meaning the only way to take a point and go back to the scalar is by breaking discrete log. And as you can see, D, which is the private key, is a scalar, and your public key is actually just D times G. Okay, it's, it's the point of the uh, private key. So the first thing, so ECDSA was standardized by NIST in 1997, um, but Schnorr was published six years before that. So why didn't we use that? It's hard to say, but uh, it's possibly because of, like, it, ha it was patented, but it, w it is NIST, which is a government entity. There's some theories on that, but mostly because it was patented. The patent, was, uh, the patent expired in 2008, I think. Um, and Satoshi, but like 2008 is a year before Satoshi published Bitcoin. But because it wasn't standardized, no one really used it, so we, there's no reason Satoshi would have used it. The, the first thing we can see is that it's simpler, right? Like this, is, this looks complicated and this just is K plus ED, like very simple. And this has a lot of implications, meaning in ECDSA we have K times G and then you take the X of that, which is just weird. We are taking elliptic curve operations and scalar operations, okay? And we're combining them, this is weird. And because of that, until today, as far as I know, there is no security proof for ECDSA, meaning there is no proof proving ECDSA is as hard as discrete log, but we have no reason to believe otherwise. Like, no one thinks ECDSA is breakable, but still having a proof is nice. And on the other hand, in Schnorr, because we don't have this weird mix, there are a bunch of proofs proving Schnorr is as hard as discrete log. Okay? A second thing to notice is that K is on the left side in ECDSA, meaning that if you want to solve for, e for S, you need to divide or modular inversion, which again is a fancy name for divide. You need to divide by K. That means A, it's a bit expensive depending on the exact algorithm and it's harder to implement constant time. B, which is more important, it's, it means the equation isn't linear. Meaning if you have three divided by X and five divided by Y, you cannot add them up, right? Like, you don't, we don't know how to do that. You can mathematically add three divided by X with five divided by y. So because of that, you can take different signatures and add them up because each signature will be divided by a different nonce. And the actual signature is s, the scalar, and k times g, which is the point of the nonce, which we will call r. Okay, now, other than the security proof and the linearity, what's cool about Schnorr? Multisig. We can easily create a multisig. Now, as I've said before, there are attacks against the naive multisig, and then in practice we will probably use something like MuSig, which is a paper by Andrew Polstra and Peter Willey. Um, 
but I want to show you the naive multisig so you'll see how easy and awesome this is, okay? And like, it's not that far off than what we will do in practice. So we have two public keys, P1 and P2, which they both have their own private keys, D1 and D2. Um, we have two signatures by, the, by both the private keys, S1 and S2. They, each one has their own K, K1 and K2, and their own private key, D1 and D2. The only thing they have is in common is E, which is the message they're both trying to sign. If we just take S1 and S2 and add them up, we can easily see that we get K2 plus K1, it's just K1 plus K2, and E D1 plus E D2 is just E times D1 plus D2, right? Nothing complicated. If we call all of this K prime and all of this D prime, then we get S prime equals K prime plus E D prime, which as you can see, that's a Schnorr signature. And it's a Schnorr signature which is valid to D prime private key. And D prime private key is D1 plus D2. So we got a signature which is valid for the addition of their private keys. So that way they can add up the public keys, get P prime, sign separately, add up, and get a signature which is valid to P prime, which is pretty awesome. But again, complications, but we'll try to ignore them. Another cool thing, which is where we start getting to tap out, is pay to contract. If we take our public key and we add to it some hash of a commitment, okay, we can and multiply by the generator to make it a point. We can add points up. And we do the same thing for the private key. We get P prime and D prime. Now D prime can sign for every can sign a signature that can be verified to P prime because we change both the public and the private key the same way, right? Nothing they are both we're, we're adding both a hash of the commitment, P, the pub, the original public key, and S the commitment. And because of that, we can, D prime can sign for P prime. Now, what's interesting about it? The interesting thing is, no one can know there's been a commitment. No one possibly can, can see that there is a commitment in the public key unless someone actually expose it. Meaning, if you see P prime, it looks just like a regular public key. But if I give you P and the commitment, you can easily hash them up and see that P prime includes this commitment. And because the hash also includes the original P, then there's no way it's accidentally there. Okay, you cannot calculate out a commitment like that. The only way, the only way this commitment is there is the person who designed P prime, who created P prime, put it there just like that. Okay, unless he somehow broke the hash, but that doesn't, that's out of the scope. Um, but what's interesting about it is S can be, for example, a Bitcoin script. Okay, let's say I'm sending someone money and I'm saying, okay, if after a year you didn't take that money, it can be, for example, a wedding present and he knows nothing about Bitcoin, I want to take back the money after a year. So what I can do is I can take his public key and tweak it by this commitment and put in the commitment a Bitcoin script that has a time lock, meaning um, for a year you cannot spend it, but the time lock says that for a, after a year you can spend it to a different address. And then, obviously, I need to tell him that. Otherwise, he'll see a payment to P prime, and he has no idea what is P prime. But I tell him this script, and he can tweak his private key just like that and spend this money. No one knows there's been this script in there. But if a year passed and he didn't spend his money, I can now reveal P and that script and take back my money. So only when I reveal it, people actually know the script was even there. If, I, if he takes his money, no one knows it's been there. Now, obviously, this is currently not possible in Bitcoin, okay? But Taproot gives us something like that. Taproot also uses something interesting, Merkle branches, meaning we all know what is a Merkle tree, right? You take two leaves, you hash them up, get to a branch, hash it to the branch slash leaf near, near it, and hash up, up until the root. We can create a tree of scripts, okay? For example, this tree has four scripts, different lengths, and then if you pay for that tree, then you could create something like that. You could say, okay, I pay to a tree of four leaves, and then when I actually spend that tree, I only expose the exact path that I'm actually using. For example, let's say someone has a wheel, okay? He wants to say, 
it, one option to use my will is my children can take the money after a year. Another option is my grandchildren can take the money after 30, year, 30 years. Another option is my lawyer can use a pre-image and take all the money to, him, to himself to redistribute it using regular laws. The point is, he can have multiple scripts sparsed in that tree, and then in practice, he'll only expose, when someone spends it, he only needs to expose the exact path he's spending. That way, if the lawyer, for example, takes the money, no one ever knows there's been different stuff, okay? That way you can hide what's actually going on in the tree and only expose the exact path taken. Now, if we combine that with the pay-to-contract, we get taproot, which is which we can take the Merkle root of that tree that I just described and use it as a commitment, okay? And that way, oh, this is the exact same equation from the top to, from the pay-to-contract, but we're putting the Merkle root of that tree there, meaning that if, for example, you want to open a lightning channel, okay? You open a lightning channel, the public key is actually from the multi-sig I showed you. It's a multi-sig from uh, party A to party B. And then if the lightning channel will close cooperatively, they'll just tweak the signature as we they'll just tweak the signature as we've seen before that you can tweak the private key to do this. Okay? And that way um, they can they can they can spend the money without anyone knowing it's been a lightning channel. Okay, because th if they close it cooperatively, they have the private keys for this pub key, they can just tweak the private key like that and spend it, which is awesome. But even if they don't close cooperatively, a lightning channel can have, for example, one branch that says this is a time lock for, time lock for party A, one branch that says this is a time lock for party B. Okay, there could be another one that says something about some sort of a pre-image if it's an HTLC. That way, if, for example, party A closes the channel, he only exposes his branch in the Merkle root, in the Merkle tree. And then no one knows that there is a party B, or even if they can assume that, they can't know what's the party B public key, or who is he. They can only see what's actually being spent. That way we can encode in the public key multiple scripts and in, the, in practice actually expose only a single branch of that, and hopefully not even that, just tweak the public key and that's it. Which is, I think, pretty awesome because it means like there's nothing new here. We're using miracle trees, we're using hashes, we're using all of that. Like these tweaks we're using in BIP32, in HD wallets. We're using stuff like this. And this is like using the same things to gain that, that much privacy, which hopefully like no one will know if Lightning Channel was open or closed or who exactly was participating in it, it's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, that's James. Oh. Hello, so my name is, uh, does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so my name's James, and unlike Eli Kai, I probably need a bit of an introduction, especially for the Israeli crowd. Um, I started uh, looking at Bitcoin around 2018. I was very involved in Bitcoin education at universities. I currently teach a developer bootcamp in Zurich um, together with uh, Christian Decker, uh, Jonas Schnelli, a couple of core contributors, a long time. And uh, before the summer, I, I felt the need to spend more time coding. So I applied to the Chainco residency, residency. And that's what I did. Um, that's pretty, that was quite a privilege to attend that. That's what I did this summer. And this is a, a project that I work on during that time that I'd like to share with you. And what it basically is, is it's a, uh, it's a Python developer toolkit for you know, people who want to learn Taproot, people who want to build like Taproot outputs and actually uh, uh, spend them. Um, and there, there are two components to it. So we have a Bitcoin Core branch. This is based on SIPA's Taproot branch um, that he's published. So the storing Taproot stuff is, is implemented consensus. And what we've done there is we've extended the Python framework in Core to include uh, a couple of convenience classes and methods, which I'll show in a second. What we've also done is um, I've created a toolkit documentation, Jupyter notebook style, um, and I want to show a couple examples of those during the during the um, talk today. Okay, so just to clarify, the the classes and Python stuff that we're using is currently lives in a Taproot branch, again built on SIPA's um, latest release, 
It's an extension of the Python test framework and includes a couple of things. So today I'm just going to talk about music on the Schnorr side, but we also have adapter sticks, discrete lock contracts um, from, from Taj. Can I check your mic? Yeah, of course. No, this one. It's better? Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, OK, so yeah, so we have uh, a couple Schnorr classes. And the idea is to get developers like building cool stuff, um, you know, unobservable Schnorr contracts um, with a very simple Python interface. We have the Taproot side, which I'll demo in a bit, and that's all about building Taproot uh, uh, outputs and constructing these trees in a, um, in a convenient and fast manner. So the goal with this stuff is really to bring it into your hands, to have people um, experimenting with, with Schnorr and Taproot. Schnorr and Taproot is not a mainnet, right? It's, it's not activated. And so the goal is that next time we have a new feature activation in, in Schnorr, that the technical com community is, is well informed um, and also able to provide feedback to the proposals which are out there right now. OK. So again, as I mentioned, there, there are two repositories that we're going to work with today. We have the documentation side, which is on the left. These are interactive Jupyter notebooks, which you probably all know from Jimmy Song's class. He's really pioneered that, pioneered that format. And we have a Taproot Bitcoin core branch where we've extended it with a couple of Schnorr and Taproot classes. All right, so I'm going to go through a couple of chapters. I've provided the links in the Slack. And um, the idea is to give you an overview of uh, what this tool can, can, can do and what you can learn from it. OK, so the first example I'd like to show is music. And Elikai alluded to that before. Um, music is pretty neat. We can create a multiple N of N multi-sig, which is unobservable on chain. You have one pub key, you have one signature. Um, however, it is very interactive. Right? And that's kind of the, the goal of this, this, this API or toolkit to, to give you an intuition of, of how that works. So let's start with the music pub key generation. What does that mean? That means you have multiple signers who want to create a pub key that they share, that they can sign for together, that can all be spent together. Um, however, that, there's a problem there, namely that um, there's this thing called like the key cancellation attack. So if somebody takes, if a counterparty takes a key and subtracts somebody else's key from it, um, and they later they aggregate it, the problem is the, the attacker can then sign for the music key uh, by himself. So that's bad. So, so the way we solve that is with, with, with a challenge factor. We generate a challenge factor that is unique to each pub key. Um, and that's done with the following hash. We hash, we concatenate all the pub keys, and then we hash that again with the individual pub key, and we, 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 uh, we obtain our, our challenge factor. Uh, we then multiply our key pairs individually with a, with a challenge factor. And once we've done that, we can finally aggregate the public keys in a way that cannot be, is not vulnerable uh, to the key cancellation attack, okay? So you can see in this code example, that's kind of what we're doing here. We're generating the different uh, key pairs. I like to note the, the classes that we use here exist inside the core functional test library. So like if you go through these exercises, you can actually learn how the core test framework works and it's a great way to get started with core development. Okay. So we have a function here, which is the, it's probably too small, let me make it a little bigger. So we have a function here called generate music key that accepts a vector of pub key objects. And what it returns is the aggregated music pub key, as well as a map that contains all the challenge factors for the individual key pairs. What you then have to do is you have to take that challenge factor, so the key value uh, map, and you multiply your private key, right, with your specific challenge factor. Uh, you need to do that so then so that you can actually sign correctly for the for the music um, for the music signature. So that's step one. We create key pairs. We create our challenge factors for every every individual key pair, and we tweak both pub key and private key. Um, in the second step, we then when we sign, we then need to create nonces, right? And um, there's, there's one thing that, you have to, that we have to kind of um, be aware of when, when we're creating music nonces, namely that the security proof needs to, the security, the security proof of uh, music relies on the fact that the nonces must be random. So if I, if I create my nonce and I share the nonce point with everybody else, I can't really know that somebody else is not generating their nonce point based on my nonce point. Uh, so there's a first round where we actually uh, first share the commitment of the nonce points, and in a second round, we actually uh, reveal the nonce points, which then can be aggregated 
to create the aggregated nonce point. And that's, so, that's what's happening here. Um, we, all, we generate our individual nonces and nonce points. We aggregate them. And, um, and we obtain the uh, aggregated nonce point. The negation is for the, to ensure that the nonce point, um, that the y coordinate is, has a, is a quadratic res residue mod, mod the field size. Um, that's related to constraining that point because in the signature we only have the x coordinate of the nonce point, and there's there's ambiguity there that we can that we want to um, that we want to get rid of. So that's 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 a boolean that's returned that we use in the next step. Finally, we sign, and the nice thing about music is, um, as you can see, the hash expression in the signature uses the aggregated nonce, the aggregated point, and so we can just uh, you know uh, we can just add the different signatures and we obtain a valid Schnorr signature, which looks like any other uh, signature on chain. So if you, if you walk through this documentation, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of interactivity that's involved, um, but again, it's nice because we, we then have a signature that, that, is, um, that is indistinguishable from a non-music signature. Okay, so how is Taproot going to be activated on chain? Um, in the current proposal from, from Peter and the Jonas, and collaborators, um, it's a SegWit v1 output. Um, so what does that mean? You guys don't know the SegWit pattern. It's a version byte and the SegWit or the witness program. And in this case, the witness program, the SegWit program is the pub key. Um, it's not the hash. It's just the pub key uh, that can be spent with the signature um, signed by the private key of the pub key, right? So there, there are two paths that, that are spendable. There's the key path, which is just the signature. And then there's the script path. So we're going to talk about the key path first. Um, as you can see here, we can just generate a SegWit act. So we, ge we can generate the witness program, right? That's the version, and that is the pub key data. Um, we append a SegWit version 1. And then we can encode the SegWit address uh, by 32 uh, address down here. OK, so in, these, in this documentation, um, what I do is I, I use a utility function that basically spins up the test nodes, which are, which are used in the integration uh, framework in, in core. And um, so you start it up, like in this cell, and so you have a RPC interface that you can call uh, with your cells. And why do we need that? We need that because we want to uh, spend this output. So the first thing we do is we generate some coins for in, the, in the Bitcoin core wallet. Then, uh, so let me skip that, then, and then we want to spend, we can construct a C transaction object. Uh, we populate the version, we populate the log time, uh, the inputs, the outputs, and um, the min fee, and then we sign. So there's a taproot um, hash digest, which, is, which you can look up in the BIP. Uh, that's changed from SegWit. Uh, optimized for, for a few couple things. But essentially, all you need to do to spend that output is to provide that signature as a single stack element in the witness. So that's pretty simple and pretty nice. OK. Let me show you um, a chapter on, on tap tweak. So, so we have the version 1 output. That's just a uh, version byte and the pub key. And what we can do with the pub key is we can tweak it. We can modify it with a, a tweak point. And the interesting thing about that is I can spend that point. First of all, it's, it's indistinguishable from any other point. Uh, furthermore, I can spend it with the tweaked private key. Right? T is simply the, the scalar of uh, point T. Um, and so that's what we're doing here. We want to demonstrate that we can actually sign with a tweaked key pair, we generate our key pair here, we create our tweak, we then tweak the point, we create the tweak point, I tweak the private key with the um, tweak scaler, I tweak the key point, the public key with the um, tweak point, and then I can sign and, and verify that's, that's a correct signature. Interestingly enough, I can also do that with, um, with music. Um, if you guys are interested, I, I highly recommend you guys uh, check that out. So in music, we, as I showed before, we aggregate the, the pub key points to obtain a music pub key. Um, I can also tweak that. I can add a tweak point to my music pub key. 
And when I sign that, the difference is that one, only one user needs to tweak their private keys in order to sign for the music pub key. So these things can be combined very nicely. I can have a music pub key and also um, tweak it. So, so why are tweaks interesting? Well, um, Taproot's about committing a script structure, or Taproot's about committing something into the, into the pub key. And so next, we need to figure out how we can create a commitment scheme um, by tweaking a pub key. And we do that, so, so, so in a naive fashion, I might just say, okay, my tweak is a commitment. Um, but that's a broken commitment scheme because I can trivially modify this commitment C and uh, solve for, for, for the private key, uh, uh, private key of, of P, right? Uh, and the way to solve that is we just put the, uh, the internal key and commitment inside a hash expression. And so the secret is in both the hash expression and outside. And if I modify C, I cannot solve for, for the private key. So, th so this is how we can create commitment scheme out of tweaking a, a pub key. And so in this example, I'm not gonna go into detail, but here we, we, we kind of just show that in the naive form, it's, it's trivial to, to solve for, uh, to change the commitment, right? So therefore it's not a commitment scheme. Um, here, you can see how we generate the key pairs, we create our tap tweak, our, our, our tweak. Um, we are applying this scheme so it's the point, hold on, is it the point? Does that have a hash limit? commitment? Yes, that's our commitment right there. Um, as you see, it's hashed inside that expression. And, um, and then we compute the tweak key pairs, both private and public, and we can sign and verify that the signature is correct. Okay, I'm gonna skip down to this part. So Elkai also showed the, the Merkle tree structures. Um, that is um, described in a little more detail here. So I think the one key takeaway is the, the, the nodes in the Merkle tree are, are tagged in the sense. So they're, let's take the leaves for example. The leaves are, um, have tap, the hash of the tap leaf inside the, the hash expression and the internal nodes have tap branch. And what that does is it removes the ambiguity between internal and leaf nodes. Um, you may know like in, in the Merkle tree uh, model in, in Bitcoin core in the, in the headers, um, because there's ambiguity between the leaf nodes and internal nodes, uh, that's actually, that's actually a, a attack vector that, that can be um, taken advantage of. So that's solved with, with uh, Taproot. Okay, so here we are actually constructing a valid tap tweak from uh, various scripts. The scripts that we're using are simple uh, pay to pub key scripts, so a pub key and object sig. And we can then compute the taproot by hashing our way up the, the tree. Okay, so one more, I think, and then we've kind of concluded our taproot journey. So finally, we can look at the actual Merkle tree structure. Um, and the first thing I'd like to show is uh, we, we kind of need a way to describe the tree. Right, the, the form of the tree, uh, the structure of the tree, the way the different scripts are actually committed into the taproot. Um, so this, you know, this is a taproot descriptor proposal. Um, in, in the core wall today, the de descript language is, is a like, human readable form to describe a specific output. Um, and that's what we're doing here for, for taproot. So we have like TP, the expression TP, we have a pub key, which is the internal pub key. And the tree structure is expressed um, as nested brackets, right? Uh, every, every, so uh, nested brackets are nested tuples. Every tuple is a node. A node is expressed as uh, its children. And as you can see, uh, we have the tap script expressions in there as well. Um, they are, in this case, they're all pub key, paid pub key uh, tap scripts. So a pub key and check sig. Um, and through the structure of the nesting, the actual tree that's committed to the taproot is implied. So if you look at the, the examples here, we can actually generate a, a taproot from a string literal, which, we're do, which we are doing here. Um, but there is another way to do that. So for a more complicated or, or larger tap tree, you may not want to have to connect all the nodes and uh, construct your taproot output that way. So one way to do it, and this is proposed in the, in the bit from, from Peter, is to use a Huffman constructor. 
And that's just a greedy algorithm where you, where you have a list of scripts that you'd like to commit. So in our case, A, B, C, D. And we, 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 just, we just indicate a probability weight. And using the, the algorithm, the tree is then constructed in a way where if the probability weight is high, the likelihood of that script being closer to the root is also higher. Right? So if I spend this script, the proof, the inclusion proof, is, is only this point. If I spend it here, the inclusion, uh, inc inclusion proof will include this hash, this hash, and this hash, and therefore is longer and more expensive to, spe to spend. Right? So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, you can try that out with the Huffman constructor method right here. We, we, we uh, uh, supply with um, arguments, which are simply the tap leaf, the individual tap leaf objects, and a, and a weighting. OK. And then finally, we spend it um, uh, along a specific script path. OK, let me conclude. Um, so yeah, the, the goal of this toolkit is to really get people to provide more feedback and to, to build prototypes on top of Taproot and Schnorr. There's some really cool privacy schemes that are, that are made possible with it. And um, I would love for you guys to try it out if you are interested. Um, the idea is that we make uh, Schnorr and Taproot experts out of all of you. And so that next time that we have an activation, uh, I think the community will be better informed and the community will, be, will have a better ability to build consensus around the features that we want in Bitcoin. Um, yeah, just Slack me if you're interested. I will help you. And um, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us here. No questions? Yeah, uh, it's on GitHub. I posted the links in the Slack. Um, just click on links. Just start with the README. And uh, if you have any trouble, just let me know. I'd be super happy to help. Hi, hey, Michael. It's a library for education or? Uh, yes, not production. Um, I mean, it's, it's like a toy library. It's, uh, that I, want, I want people to build, like, I want people to get creative with the types of outputs you can create with Taproot. You know, like you can, all these tap leaves can have cool things like discrete law contracts with Oracle execution. Um, we can have adapter sigs in there. Um, and I think there's a difference between bringing a BIP and actually building and spending one over a reg, reg test. And so that's, that's, that's really the goal. Yeah.